Uh, good morning, everyone. I'll just firstly, I acknowledge the very large number of co-authors on this paper, um, uh, working both in the Barrier Reef and the Philippines. Um, I'm going to talk about no-take marine reserve networks. I've changed the title slightly, so I'm talking about reserve networks, and I'm talking about um, environmental uh, 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 impacts on those networks. Uh, firstly, I'm going to talk about probably the two largest and, and oldest uh, existing reserve networks in the world and why they were set up. Uh, the first one, of course, is the Great Barrier Reef. We've, uh, we've talked about a lot yesterday. It was set up uh, very strongly with a, a conservation objective in mind. Uh, 70 bioregions, 20% of each of those goes into no-take zones. Uh, as uh, Daniel and uh, Ove told us yesterday, uh, can generate enormous amounts of income uh, through tourism. It can be perceived fairly, fairly obviously. A network that you might not quite realise is so large and so old is one in the Philippines. There's about 1,400 different uh, marine, reserve net marine reserves. Uh, most of them are small community-based reserves uh, spotted throughout the country. Uh, just for perspective, the Philippines, the area of the Philippines is about the same size as the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. Similar sort of coral reef areas, Great Barrier Reef, maybe one and a half million people in the Philippines is 103 million people in this, an area the size of Victoria. Uh, now this network was set up with conservation uh, in mind, but it was also in legislation set up as a part, part of a fisheries management tool. If you read the 92 and 98 legislations under which this was set up, it very specifically has a fisheries management objective. The idea is that in those no-take areas, you're going to protect uh, areas uh, from fishing, recover, recover target species, and potentially get export of fish biomass by a couple of mechanisms. The one I'm going to talk about a lot today is the potential for recruitment subsidy, uh, recruits going across those boundaries and going out into the fished areas. Uh, I'm going to talk firstly about the Great Barrier Reef. We heard a lot about this yesterday. The zoning of the Barrier Reef uh, first happened in um, the late 1980s, 1987, off Townsville, for example. About 5% of the areas were put into no-take zones. Uh, in 2004, almost exactly 10 years ago to the day, the representative area program came into uh, uh, um, existence, where about a third of the, the Great Barrier Reef came in under um, uh, no-take zones. Now, as I've just said, the very strong focus of RAP was essentially looking after bioregions, conservation of bioregions, biodiversity and conservation. But uh, if you sort of lived in North Queensland in the, uh, around 2002-2004, yes, everyone agreed it was a great idea to look after the biodiversity of the Barrier Reef, but the political issue very quickly became fishing. Great, look after the Barrier Reef, but why are you taking my fishing spot? was a very big political issue, and we got embroiled in a, in a, a large debate about well, are you just locking up all these fish, or is there potential for, for, for links or connections, if you like, between the, the closed areas, the green zones, and the blue zones? And as Morgan told us last night, the major focus of fishing on the Great Barrier Reef, both commercial and recreational, is, is coral trout. So we uh, got embroiled in this idea of do they connect? Uh, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about today uh, is, is about that and, and demonstrating that you're not just locking up fish. You you're actually uh, have the potential to connect to the outside, mostly by larval dispersal. Now, this is some work uh, uh, mostly done by David Williamson, Richard Evans and Danny Ciccirelli over the last 14 or 15 years. We've been monitoring coral trout uh, densities in this case on the y-axis and time on the x-axis in three inshore uh, islands, the Palms, the Whitsundays and the Keppels. So, um, Dave started this work in about 1998 actually uh, and it's mostly their work that I'm talking about. Uh, fairly complicated looking grass, but pretty simple story. Uh, the blue lines are pretty much the coral trout density in the fished areas. The green lines, those in the no-take areas on the inshore reefs. The continuous green line is the older zones, the, the dotted lines, the, the new ones that were set up in 2004. Um, in terms of the blue, it's pretty, it's pretty stable for the last 14 to 15 years in terms of density. Uh, you can see with some baseline data collected from Tony Ayling before the original zoning was put, set up, that the green lines kind of diverge and go upwards slightly and, and diverge through time, as you would expect, as you protect these areas, uh, and that the green lines are pretty well continuously above the, the blue lines for uh, most of that period, such that uh, in 2007, uh, the differences were about two and a half to seven and a half times more legal-sized coral trout in the green zones and the blue zones. Great result. Green zones produce more fish and bigger fish, and then the, the next question, of course, we'll get to is, uh, you know, what the heck's that, what's the good of that for me if I can't fish them is, is very often a response. 
If you run your eye to the right uh, of those graphs, you'll notice that something slightly different has changed uh, in the last uh, three or four years, such that those rather large ratios of density between green and blue have changed quite dramatically, particularly in the palms and the keppels. And I concentrate very much on the keppels because, uh, as you can see, there's virtually no statistical difference between um, the uh, coral trout density in the green and the blue zones in the keppels. That's essentially because of some major environmental disturbances that have occurred in the last few years. Um, particularly in the Keppel Islands in January, uh, we heard a lot about this from John Brodie yesterday, uh, the bleaching event in 2006 and two major flooding events in the Keppels in uh, 2011 and uh, 2013. Uh, same sort of graph, but this is coral cover rather than coral trout uh, density. Green lines, blue lines, as you can see again, Generally, the coral cover doesn't differ much between the green and the blue zones, and uh, hasn't has never never had. But you can see that there's been some major changes. That's where the new zones were set up. Cyclone Yasi has brought the the green zone and blue zone coral cover down in the palms. And the, the general message here is that the surprise, surprise, the green zones don't protect you from uh, bleaching events or, or uh, cyclones or uh, or um, as you'll see in a moment, um, flooding events as well. The, Ke the Keppel Islands was hit with a bleaching event. It affected the, the new green zones uh, quite substantially, which, and they didn't really recover uh, much. The 2011 and the 2013 floods have pretty much taken the, coral, the live hard coral cover from about 60 to 70% down to about 30 to 40%. Um, so what are the consequences of that? Um, just in quick in summary, the, 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 in the, in the Keppels, and the bleaching events and the flood plumes have, have reduced the coral cover right down and it doesn't matter if you're in a green zone, it doesn't matter. It, it, you're going to get hit uh, by those sorts of environmental disturbances fairly strongly. Now, unlike many other places in, on the GBR, and this really surprised us when we looked at it, um, there's a remarkably close correlation between live coral cover and coral trout density. Uh, the blue is the coral trout uh, density and the, coral, the live co hard coral cover is the orange there on the, on the uh, right hand side. So this was interesting because it, it basically sort of made us look at, um, after the 2011 disturbance, where most of the coral cover had, had sort of survived those environmental disturbances. And essentially, see if I can get this to work, uh, most of the coral cover was down here at, uh, um, in uh, uh, Egg Rock over here and Clam Bay, just to the south of Great Keppel. And a few sites up here had pretty high coral cover, but most of the others had been hit fairly heavily. If you look where most of the coral trout were, they tended to be, again, down, uh, get this to work a bit, down towards Clam Bay. Sorry, I can't get the mouse down there, uh, where I was before. I'll do this left hand. Uh, you can see Clam Bay uh, and Egg Rock. Uh, and essentially the story there was that where the coral cover was good and they were in green zones, you had a fair few coral trout still left. And uh, Dave Willie wrote a paper about the potential for these sites to be a uh, potential sources of recovery uh, f uh, after the disturbances and also potential sources of recruits uh, outside uh, to uh, um, help um, sustain the, the fishery. So with uh, the help of a very large group of people whose names were on the, the initial slide, uh, particularly led uh, by people like Jeff Jones, Dave Williamson, Hugo Harrison, um, we managed uh, a couple of years ago to actually measure where the larval dispersal was from those three green zones, uh, in, the, in three of the green zones in the Keppel Islands. And this is the good news story is that um, essentially those green zones were exporting recruits. This is uh, a parentage analysis with coral trout. Uh, uh, this is the inshore coral trout. And essentially, I think there's 58 uh, parent recruit relation, uh, um, links there for parentage analysis. Uh, the green zones are exporting fish out, uh, recruits out to the, to the blue zone, so the potential is there for, for helping to sustain the fishery and, there, and also potentially for sustaining future recovery after environmental disturbances. So the kind of network worked in a sense as well as we could measure it in this experiment. Uh, green, uh, green to blue linked, uh, green to green linked, and there was some degree of self-recruitment. So that's kind of the good news, but it's obviously being affected r rather uh, dramatically by um, um, environmental disturbances. I'm going to um, change tack here in the middle of the talk and go to the central Philippines. Uh, um, I've been working up here for, for 30 years uh, with my uh, good long-term colleague, Ung Hal Alcala. Uh, it's the home or the birthplace, if you like, of community-based um, uh, marine uh, no-take areas. Uh, Sumilan Island was set up in 1974, almost 40 years ago uh, this year, and uh, APO was set up in, um, in 1982. Tiny little places. 
three quarters of a kilometre long at Similon, half a kilometre long at Apo. A lot of them are like that. Uh, it's, it's set up that way for very good reason, for social reasons. Uh, you can't go setting up great swathes of, of large protected areas 10 or 15 kilometres long when you've got so many people up there in, in fishing. Um, but it does, in that red square that you can see, provide the highest concentration of no-take marine reserves in the world, full stop. There ain't no, there ain't no other place in the world like this. It's, it's got the highest concentration of these sorts of things, all built from the ground up, community support, enormous ground swelling of, of support from local people, and that's why it works. And that's the way Alcala set it up 40 years ago. Um, now, it was never set up as a network. These were set up with local management objectives in mind. And one of the quick things that we've been looking at for the last four or five years is whether they might actually work as a network, similar to what I just described for uh, the Keppel Islands. Um, what do I mean by that? In a fisheries management context, pretty simple. Uh, in the, in the, the closed areas, you get more fish and bigger fish. Uh, you may get some level of self-recruitment, but that's uh, um, for a little unlikely with these small reserves. We hope for reserve-reserve connections via larval, larval connectivity. And we sure as heck hope that those, those uh, areas that have got such high biomasses are exporting out to the fished areas and, and helping to uh, subsidise the recruitment to those fished areas. Uh, we've started to look at that in that little red square at the south of Cebu and the southern part of Negros Island. There's Sumilan and Apo, you can see the red arrows. We've used a parentage analysis, uh, similar to what Hugo used in the, in the Keppel Islands, and Hugo will talk a lot about this this a uh, uh, little later on today. We used a, a, our, our model organism to start this off was a, a butterfly fish, kitted on Vagabundus. And essentially the, the story is kind of good, really good. Uh, this is uh, 37 parent uh, recruit uh, links with parentage analysis. There are 23 uh, reserves along that coastline in southern Negros. And this is probably one of the first examples I've seen in the world where everything you want a network to do, it does. So your reserves are connecting to reserves, your reserves are connecting to fished areas, your fished areas are connecting to reserves, your fished areas are connecting to fished areas, and you're getting some levels of self-recruitment even. It's doing everything that you want. Great news, terrific news, uh, and that's the good part of the story. Um, just off the coast of Negros is Apo Island. I mentioned that was set up in 1982. Um, about 31 years ago, it's been protected, probably one of the best protected um, areas of coral reef in the world. Um, and five of those 37 links, uh, or parent uh, recruit links, uh, came from Apo Island and ended up on the coastline. So we can unequivocally say that there's links, larval con connectivity links um, from Apo to, um, to the coastline. That's the good news. Now, much like uh, the Keppel Islands, there's a, a sort of a, a slight downside to all this, and it's called environmental disturbances. Uh, I'm going to start off with a bit of history. I can't believe I put this in, but I, I, I thought, it, thought it was relevant. The, the two major disturbances I've seen in the last 30 years of this study occurred in the first two years and the last two years. The first disturbance was an anthropogenic disturbance, and it was to a Sumilan Island uh, in 1984. It's pretty spectacular. Uh, Angel and I wrote a paper about this 20 years ago, uh, and the title of it was 20 Years of Hopes and Frustrations. So that tells you that this, uh, this reserve is 40 years old this year. And if you look at that little diagram, Pearl Similon got really, uh, it was open to fishing twice after it had been protected. Uh, it was protected for 10 years and then open to fishing, but the first time it got open to fishing, it was uh, fished pretty well. Uh, it was fished with explosives and drive nets and all sorts of things. It was probably the most spectacular thing I'd seen in my life underwater. Uh, the coral cover was reduced by about 50%, and more importantly, most of the target species that had built up over nearly 10 years, things like um, some of the, the snappers and emperors, were pretty much decimated, as you probably expect with that sort of fishing. Uh, about a, almost a 94% decline between 83 and 85, as my data shows there in the red uh, oval there. But most of that occurred in a few weeks to a few months, so about a decade of accumulated benefit was wiped out in a few weeks to a few months. Now, we've pushed on since 1985. I've been going up there pretty much every year uh, for the last 30 years. And there's some data from four different islands, Apo, Similon, Selinog and Mantiga, a couple of other offshore islands. The black dots or black triangles here are the protected areas and the white triangles are the white circles, well, uh, are the, 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 the open areas. And pretty much the reserves work. Over time, the lines diverge. The reserves produce more fish and bigger fish. Works fantastically. Pretty convincing evidence, all starting from about zero and the lines diverging away from each other. They work on timescales, in this case, of about eight to 30 years. 
<clears throat> and if you look closely at that diagram, probably the most interesting data point on that whole figure is that one there. Because it says basically that about 29 years of accumulated benefit for big snappers and emperors at APO Reserve uh, was wiped out in one year. Uh, in fact, it was wiped out pretty quickly. It was wiped out because of uh, a couple of typhoons. You've probably seen this on the, in the media. Uh, Sendong in 2011, but Pablo was an absolute direct hit right on APO Reserve. It, uh, it flew straight over the top of APO Reserve. I was there at the time, riding out the, riding out the, uh, the typhoon in a lovely concrete bunker hotel up in, in a, f a little bit further to the north, and we got in the water about two days after uh, that hit. Um, so a site that had been voted in the top 10 dive sites in the world for about the last tw 25 years, went from looking like that to that in uh, pretty much overnight. And that was, that's us in the bottom right-hand corner there doing the surveys about, uh, about two days after uh, Pablo hit. And the coral cover uh, at APO in the last 30 years has pretty much done that. It's been sitting at about 50 to 60% live hard coral cover. Uh, there's the bleaching event in 98, uh, a big storm in 2010, and the typhoons in 2011, 2012 have taken the coral cover it's a moonscape, basically. I, I thought I'd seen everything when I saw Simulon in 84. That beats everything that I've seen underwater in my life. Uh, it was quite, quite depressing and quite remarkable. Uh, of course, that does a lot to the fish. You've seen the, what happened to the, the snappers and emperors on the left. Also, pretty much changed the whole fish assemblage. I won't go into the detail of that, but it's pretty obvious. That thing, even things that are not fished uh, take a big hit. Uh, in this case, on the right-hand side, the, the pomace entrance, uh, which are obviously not fished. Uh, as a control down the bottom, the other side of the island wasn't basically hit by the, the typhoon and there wasn't a great deal of, of impact. Um, so what that tells me is that uh, uh, I saw a decade of, of accumulated benefit of fish and corals removed in a space of weeks to months at Similon about 30 years ago. And I've now seen thir almost 30 years of accumulated benefit of, to fish and corals removed in the space of about 24 hours. It's a pretty depressing sort of thing to happen to you. Um, but in all of these things, there are, there are kind of um, win there are losers and, and, and some winners. And uh, surprisingly, one of the winners out of this is actually parrotfish. Um, if you actually look at the, what's ha what the parrotfish have done uh, in the last, and there's about 20 species of parrotfish in the last uh, 30 years at, at APO, and I've got similar data for Sumilon, is that um, that dotted line is not coral cover, it's the cover of dead substratum, uh, rubble, hard dead uh, calcium carbonate and sand. And most of you can look at that and say, well, there's a pretty darn good correlation there, and it is. Um, it's um, essentially as the uh, amount of dead substratum goes up, the parrotfish go up. Uh, and you can see it spectacularly so since the, since the typhoon. Many of them moved off the reef flat onto the slope, but of course that sort of, that sort of habitat is excellent habitat for feeding of parrotfish. And it's a, a pretty good example of uh, a situation where uh, it's a bottom-up control. Pretty much the benthos are driving the parrotfish rather than the other way around, and that's pretty much my conclusion from the last 30 years in the Philippines. Um, um, now, just to quickly finish up, uh, and this is another depressing part of the story, uh, Angel pointed this out after about the second one went across. Um, there's a, a sort of tracks of tropical storms and cyclones in the, in the Philippines in 1965 um, and 2013. In the 30 years I've been up there, the first 24 years we saw two typhoons go through the, the, the southern and central Philippines. Um, conventional wisdom for 20, 25 years while I was there was that the, the, the typhoons went across uh, Luzon, the northern island and the central islands. And they never went anywhere near Mindanao, the southern island, the big southern island. Uh, there's our study site there and there's our study site there in 2013. One of those lines uh, was uh, Haiyan. Uh, which I just talked to Neil Andrew, who was in Tacloba and just recently killed six and a half thousand people. It's a, so it's a, a pretty dramatic sort of events. Um, we had 20, two cyclones in the first two cyclones. Where am I? Uh, Philippines, not Australia. Typhoons in uh, the Philippines uh, in the first 24 years. We've had four in the last six years, three in the last three years. We had three in a row. Major typhoons have come through the area. So it's sort of you're looking at a sort of a frustrated man, or probably more frustrated than usual. Uh, you know, you just get to the point where you start to say, these reserves are working, the network is all working, it's all connecting, it's going to be great for fisheries management, and all of a sudden, 
big environmental disturbances start to come along and, and start to shake the castle a little bit. No, I'm a, a little bit perplexed and frustrated by all this, and so is Angel. So to sum up, um, the good news is that they can work. Uh, networks of marine protected areas, marine reserves can work as effective fisheries management tools and conservation tools. We kind of know that now, thanks to all the wonderful technologies of, of uh, measuring larval dispersal from Jeff Jones and, and various other people. Some other good news is that the old well-enforced no-take marine reserves can act as critical sources of recruits, both for recovery after these sorts of environmental disturbances and to sustain the fisheries. The bad news, which should be pretty obvious to everyone in the room, is that those old well-enforced no-take marine reserves are a lot more vulnerable to those environmental disturbances in the sense that they can lose a lot more a lot quickly, uh, very, very quickly. So you 30 years gone in 24 hours is a pretty depressing sort of uh, thing to watch. And uh, going to that is, is, a, is depressing. Now, if I've, I've asked the chair for one, one moment of, um, of, um, of to make an announcement. Oh, Terry's in the room. Where's Rosemary? Terry's there. Go and get Rosemary. I need Rosemary. Um, uh, it was supposed to be today. The president of the Philippines was, was going to... Uh, at Malacan Young Palace today was going to uh, make an announcement and make an award to my long-term colleague of uh, Angel Elkla. Uh, I got a text from Rene Abbasamas last night, and it, it's the president's too busy. But uh, Angel is going to be awarded uh, national scientist, which is uh, I'm waiting for Rosemary to come in the room because uh, this is very important for her. Um, but uh, to give you an idea of um, uh, the importance of a national scientist, uh, thank you, Rosemary. Uh, national scientist is, uh, is, is afforded the luxury of a, a state funeral. Now, I've probably known a lot of scientists in the world that probably deserve funerals in state penitentiaries, but uh, um, but in this case, I, I, I don't know too many. I don't know too many scientists that are going to have a state funeral. Uh, and Rosemary, for all those all those KPIs on those bloody spreadsheets that I'm always late for, this makes up for all that lateness. This is probably the best KPI, I think, hopefully, that, uh, that, that, that I can deliver to the centre, and um, hopefully Terry will be pretty happy with it too. We've got a national scientist in the centre, Terry. Thank you.